afternoon and welcome aboard everybody. We're going to begin in a few more minutes, but I first wanted to introduce myself. My name is Ricky. I'm going to be your docent, that is your guy here today. In the early 1920s, the U.S. didn't really have its own identity and architecture yet, so we were still copying a lot of European designs. It wouldn't be until later on in the 1920s, a couple years later, that we'd finally find the style uniquely our own, kind of uniquely American. And we'll talk about that style once we can see it from the river. But in the meantime, as we cross underneath the first of many, many Chicago style bridges, we're going to jump ahead about 80 years in time to Trump International Hotel and Tower. This is the second tallest tower in Chicago at 1,389 feet. And this is a style of architecture called contextualism. Contextualism. So you see those three patios on the building, these three setbacks. Those patios all correspond to heights of neighboring buildings. The first patio corresponds to the roof of the Wrigley Building that we just spoke about. That second patio corresponds to the height of that dome building right across the river called the Jewelers Building that we'll talk about later. And then the third patio, way, 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 way up there, corresponds to the height of this black box building that's coming into view right behind it called the AMA Plaza. But that's the idea of contextualism. It is a site-specific design, custom-made for its environment, all about blending in with your surroundings, harmonizing with other buildings in the neighborhood. Now, it was finished in 2009, and it was designed by Adrian Smith. Adrian Smith, he is an architect from Chicago who has built the tallest towers in the entire world. And you'll hear more about this guy from Chicago, Adrian Smith, a little bit later. But on our right is a true local favorite. These two iconic circular towers here on the right called Marina City. Now you may recognize Marina City from any number of TV shows, films, commercials over the years. Lots of things filming here love to feature these unique buildings. Steve McQueen's final film, The Hunter, drove out a car off the side of the building into the river. In the recent Candyman remake, there was a lovely murder on a balcony. So lots of cool stuff down there. And here at Short Nights and we always just call these the Corn Cop Towers. Who knows why? Big mystery. But in the 1960s, when these were built, nobody was really living in this downtown area of Chicago. There was an architect from Chicago, his name was Bertrand Goldberg. Bertrand Goldberg wanted to change that. He wanted to attract people to live downtown. So he built this utopian, vertically stacked world. He built a city within a city. Because in Marina City, when those buildings were built, you could have everything you need and live above the river. In these buildings, you can find restaurants, shops, a swimming pool, a skating rink, a bowling alley, a movie theater, and of course, at the bottom, plenty of Parking! A key essential to living in downtown Chicago. If you do have a car down here, parking is precious. Now, I know the idea of amenities is not very new for us in 2024, but when these were built in the 60s, the idea of having everything in your apartment complex, not really having to leave your building for anything, was a totally new concept. So Bertrand Goldberg really was pioneering a new form of apartment living. But let us jump across the river to a totally different style, this tall glass building with crisscross panels of white granite. This is gonna be 77 West Wacker. Now as we get underneath the bridge and you look back up at the top of this building, you'll see this Greek inspired temple up there. So this is a style of architecture called neoclassical. You take this classical design, sort of like the Parthenon in this case, and then you just update it using all these modern materials of glass, steel, granite. Architects really love to copycat. We've seen that in just a couple of buildings today. And it's not about stealing somebody else's design so much as taking a style people already know, love, updating it with modern technology, putting your own little personal stamp on it. Now I do want to point out this awesome little river walk area that's to the left. So the river walk here is a relatively new public amenity finished in 2016 that zippers together 1.3 miles of Chicago River shoreline. Now it's a perfect example of a little Chicago style of resiliency. Because 20 years ago, before they started to build it, nobody could really come down to the river so easily. It wasn't a, an accessible destination for people. So the city, it invested in the future, invested in beauty, and now you can enjoy the river like never before. In the summertime, you see this whole area filled with people all day long, having a drink, eating lunch, going for a job, walking their dogs. It's really become this focal point of downtown, the riverfront, which is really, really a change from decades past. Now speaking of the river, Chicago is here today. All of us are sitting here today because of this body of water. The Chicago River is the waterway that connects Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River. That is why Chicago is built where it is, because this river meets our lake not far away east, 
and they continued west via canals eventually to the Mississippi River. So we were just a huge shipping port in the U.S. in the 1800s, and we've been a center of trade, commerce, transportation ever since that time period. You can really trace everything back to the location of this river. And we're going to go back in time now. We do a lot of jumping back and forth in time today. Going to go back in time to the 1920s, my favorite decade for architecture, with this enormous, enormous building on the right here called the Merchandise Mark. The Merchandise Mark on the Lights is an iconic style of architecture, my favorite style, called Art Deco. This is Art Deco to the right. It's got deep, dark inset windows. Soaring vertical lines like these racing stripes drawing your eye up, 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 up. This polished Indiana limestone tan color, gold diamonds at the top and bottom. So this was a style for the roaring 1920s, ornate, elegant, ostentatious. If each generation sort of takes their own values and expresses them in three dimensions through architecture, then the merchandise mark Art Deco were expressing the luxury, the optimism, the hope for the future of the roaring 20s. Which, as we all know, came to a roaring halt, but I will get to that later. Because we are about to enter one of my favorite spots on the river, especially on a nice clear day like today, especially when the river is this great, and that is called Wolf Point. The area in front of us, Wolf Point, where you will be able to see nearly 360 degrees of pure glass skyscraper. Let's start over here on the left with the Nuveen building, this curvy green building here. The Nuveen building is another example of contextualism because you'll notice that the curve in the building is mimicking the curve here in the river. The blue glass matches the blue of the sky and the turquoise matches the green of the river. So that is contextualism as well. You're trying to blend in with the natural context. In this case, this beautiful, in this case, very green, curving river. Now straight ahead of us, we have two really big glass buildings with very, very interesting shapes, and they're both from just 2017. So here on the right, we got River Point, River Point, an office building, with those arches at the top and at the bottom. I do also call that one the Hot Pocket. And then straight ahead of us, we have 150 North Riverside with that really narrow Y-shaped base. Now it has that unique base shape for two reasons. Number one, so that the building's caissons, the foundations of the building, that they don't interfere with the Metro and Amtrak trains running underneath the ground. But number two, the city has a rule these days for a 30-foot setback for a river wall, for all these new buildings getting built on the river. Really important to us here in Chicago to keep our waterways, the river and lake, open and clear for pedestrian access. So that's what we have with this wide design. So we're going to deal with a little thing called building sway in wind. So to bring down the sway in this tower, inside the top of this tower, just imagine, inside the top is 160,000 gallons of water in 12 separate tanks. And what happens is when the building starts to sway in one direction, all this water just sloshes, goes in the opposite direction to correct for the sway. It's this big water shock absorber, the inertia creates this balancing liquid force that brings the building back to rest very quickly. Reducing sway, and that way also reducing nausea. It's very important, you know, you really, you don't want to get seasick on top of your fancy office tower. So we're always thinking about sway in Chicago, and we're gonna learn more ways to accommodate it, to deal with it as we keep going. But speaking of new glass office buildings, on our left is another one, the Bank of America building. The Bank of America building, one of our newest on the river, finished in only 2020. Now they also had to deal with that 30-foot setback for the Riverwalk requirement, and they did so in a really creative way. They used these huge tripod legs to just sort of vault the building in midair, suspend it by that third floor, maximize still all those floors of office space, and allow for this awesome Riverwalk bathroom. So just a really great compromise between design and urban planning. But getting back into our little time machine of sorts here, the next five buildings that are coming up on the right, the next five buildings on the right, were all built in chronological order. So they really demonstrate the evolution of architecture here in Chicago. First up on our right, this is Two Riverside Plaza. Two Riverside, another great example of Art Deco. Deep dark windows, soaring vertical lines, Indiana limestone, tan color, carvings at the top and at the bottom, clocks, 
Plaza, the Roaring Twenties. But what happened in 1929? The stock market, boom, we crashed. And we entered the Great Depression. And there was a virtual freeze in the building of office buildings from 1930 to 1957. Over 25 years of really no building offices across the country, and especially in Chicago. But when we reboot architecture in the late 50s and 60s, we jump right into black box modernism, which you can see here over on the right in gateway centers one and two, black box modernism. Now the father of this boring, I mean, minimalist style architecture was a man named Mies van der Rohe. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, really famous architect from Germany, who then came over here to Chicago, and he said that less is more. Less is more. So I think there's sort of an elegant simplicity to these black boxes. Dark, stark, they are more cheap and easy to make. These buildings, I think, are more functionally beautiful instead of being very eye-catching, aesthetically beautiful, right? But I mean, hey, why'd they build like that? How do we go from some fancy art deco style to all these simple boxes? Well, again, this was the post-Great Depression generation, post-World War II generation. People who are more thrifty, who are always concerned about another big financial crash. They didn't want to waste money on a fancy office tower. They said that they are just machines to work in. That's what an office building is. So keep it simple, keep the costs low. And that's how they built over 60, 60 of these black boxes in just Chicago alone in a pretty short period of time. Well, let us now just go on to the groovy 1970s with the international style of Gateway Center 3, the white building on the right. So in the 70s, as you can tell, we are still building boxes, but now they can have a little more style in the form of precast concrete or stone cladding, and the buildings can even be, wow, white. Very exciting, a new color to play with. Now we call these white boxes the international style, because you can see a white box building being built really anywhere across the globe in the 1970s, perhaps even in your hometown. But now, let us move on to one of my favorite decades for architecture, the 1980s with Gateway Center 4, that curvy glass building on the right. So, you know, I, I love the 80s because things went in a whole new direction. You know, architects were tired of boxes, they thought modernism was kind of boring, they wanted something with personality again. Thus, this contextualism style begins to emerge. You'll notice that the curve in the building, mimicking again the upcoming curve in the river, darker green glass matching the color of the river, and the bubbled convex windows are reflecting literally the buildings around it. So again, contextualism, you're trying to build a building that fits best in this exact location. But back to black boxes, on our left is a simple little black box building. You know, that we didn't used to talk about much on tours, and I think that make owners kind of sad. So they spent over $800,000 to put themselves on the map. This to our left is a giant You Are Here map of the Chicago River. And that little red Lego up there represents this building here on the river. See, we went down the main branch on the right there, and we turned south into the south branch, and right here at this building. So hey, next time anyone's lost in downtown Chicago, and you drop your phone in the river, just look up at that building. You know exactly where to go. So helpful. Not a single street name on it. Great. But on our right, on our right, is another enormous, just enormous Arch Deco building, which you might recognize if you are a big Batman fan, because this is where Heath Ledger's Joker robbed a Gotham City Bank in the 2008 film The Dark Knight. If anyone remembers The Dark Knight, the Joker, he drives this big school bus full of stolen money straight out of this building in the opening scene of the film. Spoiler alert, sorry. But before that, before that, this was the old post office. So when this building was built almost 100 years ago, this was the largest post office in the world. Now, okay, maybe you're asking yourselves, well, why did Chicago need such a big post office? Before Amazon, before the amazing invention of online shopping, Chicago was the mail order catalog capital of the world. We had the likes of Sears department store here, among other stores, and we needed such an enormous post office to handle this really incredible volume of mail.